Uh, Psalm 119, 176. In the New King James, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Now, Pastor Renee would probably laugh at me at this point because I'm going to hold the microphone. He alluded to the fact that I might be a little bit like my father and I might want to move around a little bit. So, yeah, we can just move that. So, thank you. Um, so, in life, there is that time of making a decision. And for many of you, as we talked about this morning, there's that time where you make a decision to follow Christ. And I spoke, I listened to a young man at lunch this afternoon talk about the day and the time and the place. He remembered exactly when he received Christ into his heart. When he said, Father, forgive me. Father, I want you to come live in my heart. I want to live with you for eternity. He, he knew the exact moment. And it's beautiful to recall that exact moment. Raise your hand if you remember the exact moment where you said, come into my heart, Jesus. It's beautiful. You remember that. So, you know, it, some of us were young. Some of us were, it was just recently. Um, but we all have that memory. And so what I talk about today is not necessarily the time where you made that decision to follow Christ. But you know, on our journey, when we're following Christ, um, and even carrying things over from maybe when we were children, there are things that happen in our life where bring, they bring us to a moment. I heard someone at lunch say, sometimes a crossroads. Sometimes we can come to a crossroads. And so um, for me and my family, this was about five years ago. And I'm serving the Lord. We love the Lord. We've been, in, we've been ministering in the United States and in other countries since I, I've been sitting on the front pew of a church since I can remember. We've, that's been our life. And sometimes you'll find yourself, though, with, with an event that will happen that will really shake things up. Has anybody ever had an event that shook things up in your life? Um, for us, it was my sister. My sister, um, my brother, whom did you, you met him this morning. He has a twin. And they're five years younger than me. And so for us, it was five years ago. I was actually started before five years ago because my sister got sick and she had cancer. And um, we, when we found out she had cancer, we just believed she believed with all of her heart, going to be healed here on earth. We're going to work through this. We got this. You know, God's got this. And... God didn't see fit to heal her in that way. So five years ago, she went to heaven. And she passed away five years ago. Well, our family's very close. And this was a shaking moment in our life. Um, this was like a shaking of the foundation of my life. And I, I'd had, I had a dream one night. And... I woke up, and I was reading in my, my, my word, and I came across this scripture, Psalm 119, 176, where it says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, that's me. That's me. I never, You know, you read a scripture a thousand times, and you don't see it a certain way, but this particular time, I was like, this scripture describes me to a T. And when you read about the, the one sheep that got left behind or that went astray, depending on how the preacher decides to talk about it, you know, the, that one rebellious sheep who stayed behind. And, and Jesus, the good shepherd, went and found the sheep. Do you remember that story? Okay. I always thought it was about a sheep who had been rebellious. A sheep who had stubbornly said, I'm not going with those guys. I'm staying right here. But for some reason that morning when I read this scripture and it said, I've gone astray like a lost sheep, immediately I was like, I just imagined a sheep 
after having had this dream about a sheep, I imagined this sheep who just looked up and without even realizing that the flock had gone and that the shepherd had gone, realizing, oh my goodness, I'm all by myself. They left me. <laughs> they left me. And for the last few years, I have been working with um, children who are in very special circumstances. And the children that I've been working with are children who have been abused. And they come in, and they come in for treatment or counseling, and they've had various types of abuse. Some have been physically abused, some have been sexually abused, and children, how many of you know children have no choice when you're, when you're a child, you have no choice in the, in the matter with a lot of things in life. Um, I tell my daughter all the time, we talk about food a lot. And I tell her, because she starts thinking, I've made poor choices and I'm not eating the way I should. And we talk about food a lot. And I tell her, you don't have a car. You don't have a job. I'm the one driving to the store and buying the food. So who's making the poor choices? So I'm, I'm the one. You, you don't blame yourself for that. You're the child. So in life, children often have to pay for, for decisions that are being made by adults. And so, in the work that I've been doing in the last few years, I've been talking to lots of kids who things have happened to them, that they really didn't have a choice in the matter. And as I started to think about this sheep, I thought about these little kiddos that I've been working with, and the fact that they just looked up one day and realized something really bad happened. And I didn't have a choice. And they look up and they're all by themselves. And they feel like everybody around me that, that I look to for support and help, they've gone, they've left. And the shepherd's gone and left and I'm all by myself. So have, have I painted a picture of this little sheep sitting there? Well, when something traumatizing happens, like happens in the lives of these children sometimes or like happened in my life. To me, this was traumatizing for my sister to be taken from me. We just really believed that she was going to be healed. And she was. She was, but not in the way that we thought she would be. And I really felt like I looked up one day and everybody was gone and I just got left. Now, that's different than when you make a choice to walk away in rebellion. Do we understand the difference? I didn't walk away in rebellion. I just felt like, like a tor mm, it's not a tornado here, a typhoon. A typhoon just happened around me. Like this horrible thing just happened to me. And there I was by myself. Well, funny thing about when a bad thing happens, you, this, there, there seems like there would be a, a smart thing to do, and that would be, let's get up and go find the Father. <laughs> let's get up quickly and go find the Lord. Let's just stay really close to Him, because He loves us, and He cares for us, and He, he wants to take our hurts away. Let's find the Father quickly, <laughs> fast. But more often than not, when the bad thing happens, in our fear and in our shock over what happened, we just sit right there, right? We just sit right there. And there's, there's a part of you when you sit there, you think, I'm fine, everything's fine. I'm fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be fine if I just stay right here. I'll be fine. There's grass around me. I'll be fine. But there's something about when the provider leaves. And that's where I want us to talk about today. Oh, she is so cute. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like, I didn't mean to get everybody's attention. She's beautiful. Um,
So I found myself sitting in this place and I thought, well, you know, I've done this for a long time. I know, I know what the movements I need to go through. I know the things that I need to do to take care of me. Raise your hand if you know how to take care of yourself. You know how to feed yourself. You know how to clothe yourself. You know how, you know how to take care of you. Are we used to taking care of, of ourselves? Well, there can be a danger in that when you're used to taking care of yourself. When you're so used to taking care of yourself, you can really start to thinking that you've got this. And you've got this and you can do it all by yourself. But there's something that happens when you stay when the provider has left. So there's a reason why the shepherd moves on. There's a reason why the shepherd moves you, right, from place to place. And that's because, now I'm, I'm no shepherd. I don't um, have a whole lot of experience with sheep. <laughs> but I know that they eat. I know we have horses and we've had cows. I know I don't look like I would have had cows, but I had cows. My dad tried to bring them in the house in the winter because he felt sorry for them, <laughs> but we had cows. And especially the pregnant cows, he felt super sorry for them and he, <laughs> like, you can't bring them in the house. <laughs> I don't know, it was pretty cold out there, Deluska. I think we just need to, you're not, we can't bring the cows in the house. <laughs> but they eat a lot. They eat a lot, which is part of the reason, you know, you keep the, keep the grass down. They're, they're going to eat. The horses, they're going to eat. Sheep, they eat, right? And so the shepherd's moving them along because he realizes we're going to have to make sure they have provision. So if you don't go with him and you stay where you are, then you're left to handle it on your own, right? And so you have to deal with what's around you. And it works for a while because there's some green grass. But after a while, you're left with barren ground. It's gone. And you can't feed yourself anymore. The Father tries to move you to cool, clear water. And if you stay where you are, you won't have that. Has anybody ever seen what happens to stagnant water? What happens? Stinks. What does it attract? Bugs, mosquitoes. And, and eventually, what does that become? Can you drink that water? No. So, the more you realize that the Lord knows what he's doing, and that he had a reason for moving you, uh, you realize it might have been a bad decision to stay where you are. <laughs> but you know, um, through this process, I, I, I journal a lot. Ra raise your hand if you journal. Do you know what that, where you write, write out all those feelings and emotions. <gasps> You're not journaling? This is so, oh, it feels so good. <gasps> Just write it all out. I try to write something almost every day. I do. And sometimes it'll be like a love letter to God. And I'll be like, hi, God. I love you. And you're so amazing. And thank you for just being with me today. And I just want to talk to you a little bit today. So sometimes it's like a really, it's a, like a love note to God. Do you ever write love notes to God? Yes. Okay. You should write love notes to God, all right? He wants to hear them. He, he, he loves to read them. And, so, and sometimes I'll just write about how I'm feeling. And I found that the worse I feel, the more I write. <laughs> you should have read my poems when I was 15. <laughs> oh, boy. Did I write some deep, deep, dark stuff, you know, just deep about life and the universe and probably cows too. I don't know. I was very emotional. <laughs> I was very emotional. But, I, and so I have, I, after my sister died, I wrote a lot and I've saved it all because I like to read it later. 
I feel I'm sounding very self-absorbed right now, but it helps me to know where I've been and where I'm going. And so I began reading back on some of my old letters. And one would be like four months after Stephanie died. And four months after she died, I wrote, I listened to a song today. I listened to a worship song and I actually enjoyed it. And I began to see that there is joy. There's joy to be had and I can see it within my reach. Don't have it yet, but I can see it within my reach and I'm beginning to understand that God does want to trade. He wants to make a trade. And I know when I'm willing, he'll make the trade. My sorrow for his joy. And so then, a year later, I kept going back to this trade. Like, it just, it became something that kept recurring in my mind. Well, I can begin to see that life is life is continuing like it doesn't it hasn't frozen in time I have to keep living and I'm seeing that that trade is getting a little closer two years three years it's like I wrote every, every year on the anniversary it seemed like that's when it got when it got close I started wanting to talk about the trade and so I began to realize that that God was trying to speak to me to say, there's, there's a trade that you can stay here. Now the grass is gone. The water is stagnant. There's nothing fresh left. And you can stay there. But if you're willing to make the trade, I'd really, really, really like to trade you. Your sorrow for my joy. Well, I'm stubborn. You can't know that by just looking at me. If you know Curtis Silcox, <clears throat> <laughs> if you know Curtis Silcox, you might know that I'm a little stubborn just because I'm my father's daughter. <laughs> but My trade took a little bit longer than most. And I happen to think that there are some things that have happened in people's lives. This is what I'm learning from talking to children. See, the children that I've gotten to talk to over the past few years, someone brought them to me and said, please help. But for every one that I've met with that someone brought them to me and said, please help, there's probably 10 or 15 more that didn't come to me. And usually it would come with something like a mother saying, the same thing happened to me when I was a child and no one believed me. Or I, was, I went through something traumatic and I never was able to talk to anyone. And so I, I know that there are people who have experienced these life-altering things. And you just, you, you just look up one day and you're just there by yourself or you feel like you are. And you just start trying to take care of yourself. You just start trying to make it, make it work. And you never really talk to anybody. You never really talk to anybody about what happened. Well, what are the other things that you end up losing when you stay in that place and you don't make the trade? Well, the other thing that's not pre present besides no food, no water, is there's no worship there. There's no worship. Because you're holding on to your hurt and you're holding on to your pain and you're holding on to the things that you have. And there's no place 
for you to find your worship. Because a lot of times what you end up feeling like is rejected. You end up feeling pain and hurt. And that really makes it a huge block for you to be able to worship the Father. You might think to yourself, what do I have to worship about? What do I have to glorify the Lord about? I'm hurting here. The other thing that's not there is there's no word. There's no word. You know, she was talking this morning about this growing process. If you're sitting there stubbornly in your place and your pain and you don't want to make the trade, there's no way for it to grow. The thing I know about the Lord is that he loves us so much. He loves you so much that he so sweetly and so gently will come back from time to time and say, are you ready? Are you ready to make the trade? Because I want you to have joy. I want you to have your worship. I want you to go deeper in the word. The other thing that you won't find there is you won't find any relief. I call it, I, I said uh, in my notes, no wind. You know, we talk about the Holy Spirit like, a wind, a rushing mighty wind. But when you are staying there in that stagnant place, there's no relief. There's no reprieve. You don't feel him because you chose to stay. So you have to sustain yourself on what's around you. You have to feed yourself on the grass that grew. So then it turns into eating old grass. And here's what eating old grass looks like. <laughs> First of all, it's not very fun. <laughs> and eating old grasses, and we did this for a long time. Do you remember the good old days? Do you remember the good old days when we used to, when we went and did that with Stephanie, when Stephanie was there, when she was a baby? And not that the memories weren't good, but they were bathed in sorrow. And it was trying to sustain ourselves, not on the Lord, not on his goodness, not on his faithfulness, but just thinking about what used to be. Do you remember what it was like before you came to Hong Kong? Do you remember what it was like before you had this life? And you try to sustain yourself just on the old memories, the good old days. It lasts for a while, but it won't last for long. That's old grass. That's not new life that God has for you. Well, when you're nearing the end and there is no grass left and there is no fresh water left, sometimes we can stand up, <laughs> and this is so me, we can stand up in antagonistic movement. This is not actually forward movement. This is not actually productive movement. It's really just kind of a stomping around kind of thing. Have you ever stomped around? I mean, just mad. <laughs> just mad. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, let me give you an example of something that really will produce, that, that'll produce antagonistic movement. And I'm just going to be very literal at, at this point. Lack of sleep. Will that make you kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? It's a cereal. <laughs> Where is Lauren? I was going to say, Lauren, write that down. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Okay. She's writing down all my dad's goofy sayings. She's got a whole list. A lack of sleep. I'm in the middle of it right now. If I say something kind of goofy, if I don't remember somebody's name, you should just oh, she's not had any sleep. Do you make good decisions when you have had no sleep? If you had to like drive a vehicle or if you had to operate heavy machinery, would that be wise with no sleep? How about lack of food? We just recently had a fast. Oh my goodness. How do you fast and still like be loving towards your children? I'm having, I, it's very difficult with no food and I'm cooking them food <laughs> because they're not on the fast and it is not really easy when you're stirring that pot to be nice about it. 
And they're like, Mommy, I don't want that for dinner. Oh, really? You don't want that for dinner? Well, Mommy's got nothing for dinner. <laughs> you don't really make good decisions when you've had no food. I'm not a really nice person without any food. But you will make antagonistic movements. <laughs> My husband and I, with no food, we could, we could have an argument with just saying, oh, really? 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 We're not even like using sentences. Really? Oh, oh, really? We're not even making sense. Because I'm not making good decisions. But I'm stomping around. And I just need a cheeseburger. Um, I'm just stomping around, but not making, not making good decisions. Lack of safety. Do you make good decisions when you don't feel safe? In the social work world, they call it flight, fight, or freeze. <laughs> when you don't feel safe, you will make poor decisions in order to get yourself back into that place where you're feeling safe again. And you're not necessarily stopping and saying, okay, Lord, direct me here. Nope, you're just like in, the, in survival mode. How about lack of finances? You've, you have no credit left. You have already spent your paycheck. And you have four more days until the next one comes. And you have no way to make ends meet in the in the flesh, in the physical realm. God is our provider, but we haven't gone there yet, right? Because you're trying to handle it, because you're over there in your own grass, that's the old grass, that's turning into dirt. You've got this. I am woman, I've got this. And there's no money left. Will you make crazy decisions? I, you, will you make some silly decisions? Yes antagonistic movement. I don't know. I got to do something. I heard somebody say the other day, she, when she gets like this, she just stomps around a lot. She's not really doing anything. But you will make poor decisions with lack of finances. Yes? Your good judgment is compromised. How about lack of trust? Well, I don't trust you. I don't trust anybody. Don't try to get close to me. I'm not going to let you. Now, a person who does that, what does that usually make that person? Lonely, right? Lonely. That's a lonely person. Well, congratulations. You don't trust anybody and you did a really good job of keeping yourself protected and safe and there you are by yourself. How's that working out for you? So lack of trust, lack of control. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> I personally, not only do I have a problem with this, but I have passed it on to my sweet, sweet daughter. And she has, to, I'm gonna talk about her since she's not here, okay? <laughs> She has to have control. And if there's no control, and if she can't control everything in her life, when she does certain things, what she wears, where she's going, what's for dinner, she loses it. She has to have control over everything. And I get to see that played out, and then I get to realize that it's a reflection of me, and then I get to go back to the Lord and say, okay, God, <laughs> I did this. <laughs> help me, and so help me so I can help her learn how to trust you, Lord. But she has a lack of trust. How about a lack of vision? Without a vision, the people perish. With a lack of vision... We're not going anywhere. So your ability to move to the next level or to move forward in Christ is blocked. But the ultimate act of giving up yourself 
will, your self-will, what you want, how you want it, and the way you want it, and when you want it, and the fact that you wanted it. I wanted Stephanie to be here. That's what I wanted. I wanted my sister. That's what I wanted. And so I sat around in the dirt, and I really pouted about that for a while. It, it didn't start off pouting. It started off as real, true, genuine hurt. I, I really don't want to downplay that because you, some of you have some true, genuine hurt that has happened in your life. You didn't ask for it. You didn't seek it out. It just happened. And I just want to say for the record, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. If I could take it away and make it like it never happened, I would. Because that's a tough thing. So I don't believe that it started out as pouting in, in your dirt area. But after a while, I got to where I was just pouting about it. I, I, want, I wanted her to be here. And she's not here, God. And I don't understand that. And so you kind of do a little blaming of God. He gets blamed for so much stuff. So I was kind of in my pouting mode. But there's that moment where you finally look up and you go, you know, the trade's not looking too bad. Right? No, let, let, me, let me give you the scripture for it if I have it. I think I do way back here. Yes, Psalm 35. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Okay, so I had this picture above my bed okay and it was a little girl in a 30 and 5 and it was painted with little yellow flowers and there was a little girl in a field and there was a big tree on the side and it was above my bed and my mom and dad bought that picture for me when they did my room yellow when I was a little bitty girl and so from like four the age of four I had this picture above my bed and so um, because I enjoyed, you know, making up things about myself and thinking about myself. You know, I had pictured that I was the one in this picture and I had it in my mind. And so above my bed was this picture of this little girl for years. And I had this whole scenario of her in the field and she was happy. And so that's really the picture of before the stuff of life really happens to us. And as I got older, I had pictured that there was this dark forest next to it because that's when I really walked away from Christ. And this dark forest was next to it and I had walked into this dark forest and I kind of gotten lost there. And all of these things had happened in my life. And then when my sister died, I, this lady had a dream, literally had a dream that, that my sister was dancing in this yellow field. I was like, whoa. And I was like, okay, God, I feel like you're trying to kind of comfort me with that and was dancing in this yellow field and so the other night we were in a worship service and there was somebody up on the stage singing you know he's running to you God Jesus is running to you and all of a sudden I pictured that dark forest part again and the Lord running to me and grabbing me up and scooping me up out of the dark forest and bringing me back to that beautiful yellow field. And I immediately went back to the scripture where at the beginning I said, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. And so I imagine myself at that point just crying out to God and saying, okay, I am like a lost sheep, God. I'm here all by myself. I didn't, I didn't, I just looked up and you were gone and this terrible thing happened. And, um, but seek me, seek me. Now I have always said that the Lord, 
He's not hiding from us. He's not hiding from us. He never has been hiding behind a bush and saying, look at him, guys. Angels, do you see this? She's seeking me. She wants to find me, but I'm going to stay behind this bush, and we're just going to hang out for a little while, and we're not going to let her find us. This is going to be so much fun. <laughs> that is not God. That is not our God. He's not hiding. He's not waiting for it. He's, I don't know, let's, let, let her wait it out for a little bit, and then I'll pop up from behind the bushes. I'm here. He is waiting for you to say, Seek your servant. I'm here. I am desperate. I do not want to do this by myself. Come find me. Come find me now. Please. I remember your commandments. It was never that I went away from you, Lord. It was never that I was in rebellion, Lord. It was never that I didn't want to be near you. I've just been so hurt. I was afraid to get up. I was afraid to go with you to the new field. I thought I could do this myself. I thought I could handle this on my own, but I can't. Seek your servant. Find me. And he does. And he does. Do you believe that he loves you so much? That he does. He'll, he'll seek you out and come right back to you and pick you up where you are. He's been waiting. You know, he's such a gentleman. He's not going to push himself on you. He's not going to grab you up by the neck, drag you off to the new field. That's okay. She doesn't know what's good for her. I'll just, it'll only hurt for a moment. I'm just going to drag her to the new field. He's such a gentleman. He'll wait. If you choose to stay and you, use, you choose to do this yourself, he'll let you. All the time waiting patiently for you to call on him and say, seek your servant. I am like a lost sheep and I need you so much. And I want to trade. I want to trade. So it's a good trade that he makes. Do you believe that? It's a good trade. I want you to know though. When you call on his name, when you call to him for help, and when you say, okay, Lord, I'm ready, I want to trade in my sorrow for joy, that movement's going to be a little rough at first. Have you ever, um, like, had to stay in bed, you know, you got sick and you stayed in bed for a week or two, you were just sick for a few days, but did, when, you get, when you get back up, is it hard to move? Broke my ankle a couple of years ago. It took months and months and months to rehabilitate because I kind of broke it in half. Apparently, when we do things, we do them all the way. And it took months to rehabilitate. So I want you to know, it's going to be hard at first. When you stand up and say, okay, I'm ready to go and leave my pain behind. I'm ready to trade my sorrow for joy. Because that movement is new movement. So it's going to be hard at first. But I'm telling you that it's worth it. It's worth it. Now, when, when we go to school in the mornings, um, I pray with all the kids on the way to school. And we have um, a prayer for each child. And then we pray for their teachers. Do you pray for teachers and people in, people in your town? Do you pray for your leadership? I know you pray for this leadership. Are you praying for elected officials? Are you praying for school systems? It's a revolutionary thought, I know. But I, I am. I am praying for school systems. Not just the school that my kids are in. I'm praying for all the schools in my, I guess would be my province. And then I say a prayer for all of the children. I pray for all of the children. And there, here's what I pray. Father, I pray for all of the children who are being abused. 
I pray that you would reveal it to someone who will get them the help that they need and that when that is revealed and they get the help that they need, that, Lord, they will realize that you are the true healer and the answer to their prayer. Wouldn't you, as a child, like to have known that someone was praying for you? Even though you didn't know their name and you didn't know their face, that you had someone praying for you. So I've been praying for these children. So I encourage you. I encourage you to just let the Lord lead you and find a group to pray for, to intercede for. And so I would like to also extend that prayer to this group. That Father, for those who are here, who are hurting, and who have gone through something very painful, that Lord, you would show them that they can trade in their sorrow for joy today. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and let's bow our heads. <clears throat> God, I am so grateful, Father, that even in, these, even in these words, Lord, that you, Lord, are speaking to hearts, that you are speaking to lives right now, and that you are drawing them to you, Father. You are drawing them up out of their brown, dead grass that they've been sitting in, and you're telling them that you can trade in their sorrow for your divine, glorious joy. God, I am so grateful, Lord, that even though it's, it's hard to let go of those things, it's hard to give those things over to you because we really don't know how and it's, a, it's such a difficult thing sometimes, but God, I thank you that we can and that you're standing there with open arms and that when we stand here today and say, seek your servant, I'm like a lost sheep, seek your servant, that you're there to find us and hold us and never, ever, ever let us go. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that today you are speaking to hearts and you're, and you're saying today's the day you can make the trade. Today's the day you could trade in your sorrow for beautiful joy. Ekum na yesu no 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 ye ko omnea Yam na we shutu ana na ye Ne ye kum na na we I just want to invite you today that if you want to make that trade I invite you to just step out and I would love to pray with you and just agree with you that it's a good trade Oh, I just thank you, Father. And I'll pray with you today. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that right now, right now, Lord, I realize that you told me, Lord, that you would trade in all of my sorrow for joy. And I thank you, Father, that I've been able to give that to you, Lord. And even though I had to do it in pieces sometimes, God, that I was able to give over that sorrow to you. You're such a good father. You're such a good father. Koyem na na Yesu ananaye. Yeshu um na nawe.